Hello, this is the third video of our Ontology of Money series. And this is a special one. Right behind me, what you can see is the building which became famous for the bank robbery that took place uh, some decades ago and uh, has become known uh, for the expression Stockholm Syndrome. And this was a uh, a bank and a bank robbery took place in which the uh, hostages of this bank robbery they eventually sympathized with the bank robbers uh, the details of this event is not really relevant for the point that we are going to make in this video but um, we're going to raise some questions in this video rather than um, teaching anything well we are going to, to teach some things or to discuss some things but um, do we live in a time which we as citizens and regular folks are we living in a Stockholm syndrome a perpetual or a consistent state of Stockholm Syndrome in regards to the banking system. Well, in the previous videos we discussed the um, emergence of money in societies back in ancient Mesopotamia nearly, roughly nine to ten thousand years ago initially we spoke about the uh, oral transmissions of promises to pay as being the uh, vehicle or the medium of intermediary exchanges the function as currency for a while you cannot precise uh, the um, uh, for how long it remained as such or it functioned as such but uh, archaeologists then understood that the clay tokens were these um, were, the, were used as currency for representing the promises to pay of the people and uh, after 4,000 years then the clay tokens evolved into the clay tablets and we had already um, a structure of power in place an administrative structure which had the scribes as being very important in this in the aspect of um, registering the promises to pay and most likely they were involved in the enforcement of the promises to pay as well because if they were contractual obligations between the people or promissory obligations as we explained in the previous video there should be the enforcement of these uh, contractual obligations um, so that those who bear uh, who, who would bear the tablets or tokens even could make sure could be sure that they would be um, redeemed that those tokens were redeemable otherwise they would be in a very uh, vulnerable situation uh, in which the promisor could perhaps choose not to fulfill the obligations or their promises to pay again the promises to pay were in goods or services, right? So one would promise cheap and so on. I would need to fulfill that promise. The token or the tablet uh, doesn't need to have or didn't even have any intrinsic value in on itself because it only served as a medium to represent value that would be delivered in the future. 
<laughs> then, with the uh, imposition of precious metals as the currency, or not even as uh, uh, imposed, it was even uh, it wasn't imposed as the currency. Most likely, uh, it became the the um, medium used after the imposition of taxes in the form of precious metals. Meaning that once the rulers they imposed taxation to be collected only in silver or gold even, then the people who were used to use the tokens or tablets as the currency because they were interested in exchanging their production with each other, promising their production and exchanging their produ production indirectly through the medium, they saw themselves uh, nearly obligated to to get silver, to have in their possession silver. And why? Because if they uh, were obligated to pay taxes in silver, then they would need to have a way of um, getting hold of silver. They would try to exchange their own products for silver. But those who controlled the mines, for example, who had um, control over the production of silver, they would, um, it would uh, be um, a situation in which they would um, accept a ship for silver, for instance. And as they understood and um, they understood that the precious metals were starting to become the accepted currency everywhere, of course, they developed a system of lending, something that was not present in those societies until that point, because no one would need to borrow anything or any money because the people themselves were clearly the issuers of the promises to pay. The promises to pay represented their production, their future, future production, and they were the redeemers of those promises to pay. But once the tax that they needed to pay to the rulers to remain as participants in, in those societies, once they, they needed to have the silver, they saw themselves in a vulnerable situation in which they uh, would even recur to borrowing, borrowing silver in order to pay taxes. So silver, precious metals, then, uh, they were not simply naturally adopted as the, um, the currency. No. It was a forced course into the system. And eventually it became uh, predominant. Not because uh, it was um, simple, portable, fungible, as so many um, purported economists preach out there, but because the people needed that. And then they saw themselves even in a situation that they would pay interest. Another concept that is uh, derived of lending which was all, uh, another concept that didn't exist. So we have two uh, anomalous concepts emerging in this scenario. Lending money, or supposed money, and interest. 
on top of it. Initially it was called usury. Uh, only in recent times that the term usury has become something else other than the mere imposition of interest. Uh, nowadays, usury is, uh, um, according to dictionaries, modern dictionaries, so-called uh, excessive interest. Well, this is a topic for another video, but um, there you see that the people were the masters of money. The people uh, either um, conscious of it or not, they knew that the, uh, the circulating medium represented their production. It didn't represent an object in on itself that they didn't produce themselves, such as silver. So they would need, there would be absolutely no need to borrow any promise to pay. You don't borrow your own promise to anybody. You wouldn't recur to someone else to, to, to lend you your own promise. It's even absurd to think about that. Well, in the, in the previous video I promised a jump of uh, 6,000 years. And we are going to make it now. So, then we are talking about promises to pay, promissory obligations, initially an oral transmission, then in simple tokens, objects, that represented those promises to pay, then after 4,000 years the evolution to the clay tablets, which was the notation. Uh, the writing system was invented to represent the clay tokens, so the uh, symbols represented the clay tokens. And then, the scribes then, uh, most likely they offered uh, this as a service, a commissioned service in the beginnings, because the people uh, were free from government even. There was initially no city-states and no uh, absolute rulers, uh, such as those that emerged even claiming that they were uh, godly figures on earth themselves, claiming to themselves uh, even divine authority over the people. So, uh, the, these, um, these scribes, if they are offered this um, service of maintaining the records or encoding the promises to pay and being the decoders of those uh, cuneiform scripts because they uh, had the knowledge to do uh, so they were central figures to resolve disputes to certify that uh, the person A w uh, had indeed committed to pay and therefore was obligated to pay, for example. And if they were commissioned initially and not as a uh, supposed uh, uh, governmental uh, authority, if they were private uh, individuals offering the service, and this is just supposition uh, and if they got commissions from each of those uh, transactions they would start to develop power to gain power together with the um, rulers that emerged that uh, in that context they um, they were uh, kept in the palaces in the in the administrative functions in very important roles to keep uh, track of uh, anything related to the administration of the cities, of the kingdoms, um, even writing the rules as devised by the rulers to keep them uh, in a record, being those who would 
uh, even read um, and proclaim the rules for the rest. So um, we have a proto intermediary system there, or it was already an intermediary system, but if it was commissioned, it was um, some sort of a proto banking system that we're talking about. And once the um, the precious metals became uh, the um, adopted currency, then we can already start to think of a more um, a closer system to what we have today in regards to banking to the banking system. But what do we have today? The jump, right, of thousands of years. If you go to the um, central banking uh, manuals, you will see that still to this day we are we are dealing with promises to pay, promissory obligations, promissory notes. So if you think about the um, the uh, clay tablets, which contain the notation specifying the uh, promissor. Uh, the whatever was promised and other clauses in that um, obligation that was a promissory note and the banking system deals to this day with promissory notes if you go to the um, publication by the Federal Reserve of the United States called uh, Modern Money Mechanics which was published by the Federal Reserve Bank of Chicago, you will uh, read the quote more or less along these lines. I am not reading it, so it's uh, from my memory. Uh, it says, of course, they, the banks, do not, when, when they make loans, they do not um, make it taking money from reserves and um, giving it to the borrowers. What they do instead, no, even before that it says, if they did so, no additional money would be created. What they do instead is to accept promissory notes in exchange, uh, in exchange for credits to the borrower's transaction accounts. Let me repeat the quote that along these lines, okay? Um, of course, they do not. Uh, uh, of course, they do not lend money from the, res the uh, existing reserves or from existing deposits. If they did so, no additional money would be created. So. It's saying that uh, the act of lending, money is being created. The act of lending. What they do instead is to accept promissory notes. But from who? From the so-called borrower. The borrower will sign the promissory note, promising, promising to pay uh, a specified sum of principal, uh, and interest on top of it and the banking system then then accepts that promissory note uh, trusting that the so-called borrower will have the ability to pay it according to their calculations so-called and uh, with even the uh, requisite of having collateral so collateralized so-called loans and the credits are created in the system and they will end up in the so-called borrower's transaction accounts. Well, what do we have here? It's the same situation. Um, it's the same situation. The so-called borrower is promising so many years of production regardless of what is the production or the product that is being that is going to be produced or the service that is going to be rendered to the economy 
uh, and on the uh, other side of the equation we have someone giving up property so let's say the so-called borrower is going to buy a house so then we have two parties in this equation in terms of exchanging production one is the so-called borrower promising to produce so many years uh, to, to deliver so many years of their labor to produce and uh, absorb money that it, that same money that was created back in order to pay the indirect exchange and on the other hand we have the um, what we should call the true creditor the true creditor who gives up the property who is giving up the property is not the banking system you you want to buy a house there's a, an owner of that house that is the true creditor who is uh, giving credit to your promise to pay because what they receive are representations of your uh, future production that they will use to take from the overall pool of wealth um, equal measures to their to the value that they are giving up that's what was supposed to happen well but then we have the intermediary there and the intermediary the banking system is claiming to itself all those so-called so credits that were created and even imposing interest on top of it is there any lending taking place or just a promise to pay that the promisor must fulfill in order to complete the indirect exchange is there a true loan taking place well I'll leave you with these uh, questions then is usury the imposition of interest even justified when it is clear that that newly issued money did not belong to the banking system if there is no loan how can one justify or no true loan taking place how can one justify the imposition of interest there's a concept called consideration of value uh, a legal concept in which anyone who uh, has a uh, commercial contract a contractual obligation that uh, this person must fulfill their part to give up value if you uh, hire uh, an internet company to provide you the service of providing internet the consideration of that company is to provide you the service and your consideration is to pay whatever was specified in the contract monthly both sides must give up consideration of value and uh, when we are talking about buying a house then the one who gives up the house gives up consideration the house valuable consideration the so-called borrower who is in fact the promisor is giving up value by producing and commercializing those products or services to um, reabsorb the money that he then he himself created because he is the true issuer of money no money would be created without the promissory note the currency that is generated in, in that in this system represents the value that will be delivered to the market by the promisor it doesn't represent prior ownership of anyone so how come one can claim to be lending and even on top of that demand the payment of usury imagine a world without usury I'll leave you with this 
uh, questions um, and in the next video we follow up I hope you enjoyed the uh, Stockholm Syndrome uh, rant are we living in a constant state of living in a, uh, a Stockholm Syndrome Can, you, can we cure ourselves of, uh, uh, of this disease? Well, I'll leave you with these questions. Thank you. Uh, if you enjoyed this video, then like, subscribe, so you can follow up the next ones in our Ontology of Money series. Thank you. Bye.